Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to another video. We're here in this beautiful secluded valley and we are wild camping. That's me and Bobby, uh, also known as the Bean. <laughs> um, we've got a brew in my spend more time in the wild mug and uh, this is kind of a big deal for me, you know. Um, wild camping is, is a very sensitive subject for a lot of people and I've wanted to talk for a long time about overcoming fears um, when wild camping either with other people or alone and today I'm hoping to address that. We're going to dive into some of the barriers um, and some of the perceived fears of wild camping and how we can overcome them. So settle down, grab yourself a brew and uh, let's get started. <laughs> So to kick this thing off then, you have decided you want to get wild camping, but you're just not sure how to start or you have a lot of anxieties and fears. Um, first of all, let's actually just have a look at the legalities of wild camping. So in the UK, there are a handful of places you are actually legally allowed to camp. That's Dartmoor National Park in the southwest of England, kind of near me. Um, there is Scotland. You've got the right to roam. You can camp up in Scotland other than in basically fields which have livestock in. And then there's a lot of debate about whether or not you can legally camp above the tree line. So if you're in the mountains, the trees grow up to a certain point. And then above that, it's usually just rocky and loads of heather and ferns and whether you can camp up there. That being said, people camp all over the place um, and I think generally if you're leaving no trace and you're not bothering anybody, you're not pitching in the middle of a footpath, I don't think there's a real big issue with where, wherever you want to camp. That being said, um, as soon as you go into Europe or internationally, again the rules are very different. The Tour de Mont Blanc, for example, which starts in Chamonix in France, goes through Italy and Switzerland as well. And every country has its own rules with regards to wild camping. So you need to look those up. There's a hefty fine if you get caught of 650 euros and you get told to move on. Whereas in reality, here in the UK, all that's going to get hap all that's going to happen if someone finds you is to tell you to move on. So. Um, it's basically up to you if you want to risk it for a biscuit uh, and uh, you know if you are super anxious about being caught that is one of the barriers we're going to be talking about today anyway um, then with regards to how you wild camp there's different setups you might decide to go for there's just your classic tent camping so you've got your tent your roll mat sleeping bag cooking system whatever um, and then you've got your more stealth camping so you might take just your sleeping bag and just a bivy bag which is almost like a plastic lining that goes over your sleeping bag and roll mat in order to protect them from the elements. Sometimes they have a bit of a hood that comes over so that you are completely protected. Um, and I know a lot of people enjoy bivying. I haven't done a huge amount of bivying, but the, that sort of brings me to why am I making this video? And here at Wild, you know, we're all about being authentic and honest. And the progression of the videos I've been producing has essentially been following my own personal journey with connecting with the outdoors. And the truth is I have struggled with wild camping for a long time and I still do. What do I struggle with? Well, many of the anxieties we're going to be talking about today. It feels very overwhelming. It feels very intimidating. There's a lot of unknowns. And uh, that is why I feel like I have the ability to talk about this because I'm not somebody to which wild camping comes naturally, but I want to be, I want to get comfortable with that. Let's chat about some of the barriers then. So for example, you know, you might find that you're scared of the dark. You might find that you're afraid of not having technology with you or no signal. You might find you're afraid of being alone. You might be anxious that you can't find anywhere to pitch, um, that you won't have enough food and water, that you don't know how to get water. You might find um, that you're afraid of different noises that you don't know or understand. Uh, you're afraid of being caught. We've touched on that already. Somebody finding you and telling you to get off my land. <laughs> There's so many different anxieties that we might feel when it comes to starting wild camping. And I really feel step one to addressing this is identifying those fears, is identifying those barriers. If you can, have a chat with friends, have a chat with somebody who perhaps is good at wild camping or enjoys wild camping, have a chat with people who are completely neutral and see if you can actually put into words what the barriers are for you to getting out wild camping in a wild and natural space. Welcome to my humble abode. So this is it, I'm all pitched up. I was gonna sign off for the day, but I've got to show you this place because it's so cool. I haven't even properly explored it yet. So I have access down to the river just there. And that's where I'll go get some water in a minute. I want to show you my Sawyer micro squeeze. This is the way we came into the little area. And these are the views we're camping in. 
Incredible. <laughs> Step two then is to know that you kind of need to start at home with this. Preparation and mindset really does begin at home. So obviously, yes, at home, we've, we've looked at our barriers, we've looked at our anxieties, we've looked at our fears, we've got those down on paper. Awesome, hopefully that's gonna really empower us. So with step two, we need to start to prepare our gear at home. So just making sure we've got everything ready that we know we're gonna need. We've got our shelter, we've got our sleeping system, we've got our cooking set up, we've got insulating layers, we have got potentially a water filter, we'll get onto water in a little bit. Um, you know, we've got our comfort things, maybe we need a little soft toy, we've got our MP3 player or the dog. Mind you, he's more scared than I am. <laughs> um, that's, that's sort of step two, is getting getting your kit ready, making sure you feel prepared in, in, in that field as well. Especially if you're new to this whole hiking and backpacking thing, just getting yourself familiar with your kit. Then what you can do is step three, if you're genuinely new to camping, is to practice camping in a safe um, and comfortable environment. So that might literally be in your garden. That might be, oh, I'm gonna hike down the road and camp in a friend's garden. That might be, oh, I'm gonna hike down the road and camp in a campsite. <laughs> and just getting familiar with your setup. If you're trying, basically what we're trying to do is to remove all the different possible barriers that might prevent you from feeling comfortable in a wild camping situation. We want to make sure we're actually using our mental energy and mental activity to fuss or concern over things that actually do need some kind of attention, such as where are we going to pitch, how are we going to get our water, come to that in a minute. So it's basically just making sure you're familiar and, and happy and comfortable and able to use your kit. That's going to just really help when you're out and about actually in a wild camping situation. So step four, I think we're on now, um, easily lose count, numbers, <laughs> is to um, consider whether you actually want to start wild camping with a friend or with somebody who's done a little bit of wild camping before. Often when we go alone, um, you know, it, it can feel super, super scary because we are alone and we are um, hearing all the sounds just by ourselves, and, and we might not understand what's going on. And actually, it's all the decisions that we have to make in terms of, like we just said, where are we going to camp? Where are we going to get water? Um, what time should I camp? It's, 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 it's a lot to take in, especially if you're genuinely anxious about the situation as a whole. So starting camping with a friend or a family member or somebody who is part of a community that you're in can be a really nice place to start as can going wild camping somewhere close to home it doesn't have to be a million miles away it doesn't have to be on the longest trail you've ever walked i mean perhaps that's where you're actually going to first experience wild camping but it's kind of nice to be able to try that uh, or try the wild camping situation when you're close to home for example here i'm about half an hour's walk from my house <laughs> which is great um and that just makes it very comfortable for me. If, for example, I, um, I I get anxious or I have some kind of issue with my head, then I know that I can actually just walk back home. Super easy, super simple. Now, a lot of people's fear is being caught. And I have to say being caught or perhaps somebody knowing where I am um, more than somebody knowing where I am is one of the anxieties for me. Um, I don't want people to know where I am. I want to be undisturbed. <laughs> and it's not animals that I'm afraid of. It's, it's people, it's interactions with people. So some people tend to take the approach of actually just asking landowners if they can stay on their land, knocking on a door and being like, oh, whilst you're at it, will you fit up my water bottle? <laughs> Um, I don't tend to go for that approach. I tend to sort of wait till it's really dark, hold my breath, pitch up as quietly as I can, and then uh, get going first thing in the morning. So you kind of have to be open to embrace the the, <laughs> the long days when you're wild camping, especially in summer. You know, it doesn't get dark till like 10 p.m. So you're probably gonna eat your food before you've pitched up and then pitch up later in the day. Long hours, um, something to just, you know, get, get your head around. But um, I can tell you a funny story so last year, um, myself, Anna, my partner, and Anne, my friend, um, we went and walked the Coleridge Way from Neverstowe in the Contox to Linton and Limmouth on Exmoor. And uh, we had to well count those two nights. And one night, you know, it was getting on a bit. And Anna, she's German, she's 
far more comfortable <laughs> talking to people than us English folk. Uh, she literally like legs it across the field to a farmer in his truck who's like sorting out hay bales. I don't know, a quarter, a half a mile away. We can see her like running in the distance and uh, she's like chatting to him. Basically, we wanted to ask if we could camp in the corner of his field. My personal opinion should be, we just wait till he goes, then we camp in the corner of his field. <laughs> but anyway, she's then running back like, woo, super happy and absolutely like <laughs> exhausted by the time she gets back to us because it was a bit of a run. Uh, very funny to watch though. And yeah, he said we could camp in his field so long as we go first thing and don't touch the hay. So we pitched up, easy peasy, had a really nice night actually. And it was much better than um, pushing on for another three or four miles to get up into the moors. It, it worked perfectly fine. It was sheltered, it was safe, it was comfortable. Hello, how did that go? Smiley one, who has so much ridiculous energy. <laughs> Went well. Yeah? Yeah, he normally does not encourage it. Yeah. But behind the white sacks back there. Oh, behind and the there sacks. are some oh, white sacks. Okay. In the middle of the field. Do you like the house? I love the house. It's so like happy and yellow. <laughs> yeah, it is. It makes me very happy. It does? Yeah. Can I hang yeah. up my socks on the washing line? No, <laughs> you can keep them outside. Please. No, they are new and you've only worn them a day, but they're all wet. <laughs> but look how sad they are. Yeah. It's a sad, sad, sad situation. Oh, come on. <laughs> so that is an example of where things can go perfectly right. <laughs> um, an example of where things can go wrong um, I, again, I can only speak from experience, is I know a lot of people are afraid of noises and uh, generally I'm very, very familiar with, with nature, the sounds of nature. Um, a nice way to sort of start to get comfortable with the sounds of nature at night, if you don't live in too urban an area, is to sort of leave your window open at night and listen. Oh, that's an owl. Oh, that's something screaming. What is that? And then you look it up and you realise, oh, it's a vixen, a female fox. Um, they scream and they scream loudly. Um, and it sounds like somebody is being murdered. The same as when a rabbit gets caught by a fox. I mean, they scream as well. They sound like somebody's being murdered. <laughs> I know those sounds, I'm comfortable with them. Um, you know, the rustling of the, the fly sheet against your tent can sound like footsteps sometimes. Um, there's all sorts of things. Our, head plays, our heads can really play tricks on us when it's dark. And mine did just that again on the Coleridge Way the second night. So a little story for you. Um, my f one of my first wild camping experiences was near Blakely Ridge on the North York Moors in a national park in the east of England and northeast of England. And um, I struggle a lot with my mental health and I experienced my first um, episode of undiagnosed psychosis. Absolutely terrifying. I ended up walking around in the moors in the mist all alone, um, unable to sort of see clearly because I have all these gruesome images coming towards me. Um, and that really impacted me <laughs> getting out while camping and it's one of the biggest barriers for me now is I'm afraid of that happening and it happened for the second time whilst while camping on our second night on the Coleridge Way. So we pitched up by a river um, in a valley in Exmoor and um, it was a windy night. It was pretty much dark when we were pitching up actually because I'd been quite unwell that day and I ended up curled up in a fetal position in a church porch. Uh, long story, but essentially we're there lying in the dark and there's this really eerie squeaky howl that just intermittently kept coming. And I, I went into this again undiagnosed psychosis sort of experience. Anna was with me this time because we were, we were in the same tent. Um, and she's trying to calm me down. I cannot see clearly. I'm like, there's just red and horrible things. I, I don't need to go into detail of what I'm seeing. I, I'm in the biggest state of panic and fear I've ever been in in my life. Like nothing gets me scared like that does. And uh, eventually, you know, even though she's trying to tell me it's just the wind, it's just the wind, it's the wind catching in something. And I was trying to tell myself that, but no way were my, <laughs> my nerves were not calming down. I was terrified. The actual definition of terrified. <laughs> Um, and paralyzed, I couldn't move. And I wanted to be brave enough to go out and have a look. I imagined if I was on my own that I need to be able to do this. I'm trying to get comfortable wild camping. But in the end, Anna goes out and she identifies, um, because we were saying, oh, it must be a gate swinging. But I was like, that's stupid. There's no gates around here. We're in a valley, there's trees. <laughs> and uh, she does identify that it's a tree. It's a loose tree branch rubbing against another piece of wood. And it created this intensely eerie sound. And then with that knowledge, it was like, okay, 
fine. Now I need to calm down because I know what this actually is. It's not some like spirit coming to get me. <laughs> um, and but we didn't get much sleep that night. Let's be completely honest with you. But you know, now knowing that logically that was a tree, not a gate either, that actually is so much more empowering when you're really scared to get out and go and have a look. Um, and that's where being with somebody else can be also a very good thing. <laughs> um, the truth is, you know, there's nothing in nature here that can hurt us. In the UK, I speak specifically. There's no animals, there's no creepy crawlies. You know, worst that's going to happen is you get a rat or a mouse come in. And I remember mum messaged me once when she was backpacking on the Dales Way and she had a rat come in and grab her food bag and run away <laughs> and she had to chase it across the field. <laughs> and that was on a campsite. Um, so the truth is you are going to have interactions with potentially unknown experiences, unknown sounds, unknown animals, but that's okay. And so long as you're in the right mind frame to be like, I am one with nature, <laughs> you're, you're gonna be okay. Um, and all the, the worst that's gonna happen, what is the worst that's gonna happen? Is that you're gonna end up being awake all night and then you're just tired the next day. You know, essentially getting educated can be really empowering. Get familiar with sounds, get familiar with, with, with noises, um, you know, and, and generally, hopefully things will be a little bit more comfortable for you. Good morning, folks, and welcome to the woods. This is our pitch last night. I have to say, feeling a little bit rough this morning. It was a rough night. Um, my head went into imagination mode. There was a very strange noise coming from the trees and the wind rubbing. It sounded like metal. Um, Anna tried to reassure me that it was a gate. My head was having none of the reassurance. Uh, we're up and getting ready to go. Halfway through putting my tent up and it starts to tip it down. So I just ran in here. There's so many midges as well. Oops. <laughs> Great end of the day. I know a lot of people are also very afraid of being uncomfortable, being too cold, not having signal. Um, and that's something essentially where the preparation needs to start at home. So making sure you've got enough layers, you've got a good sleeping bag, you've got a nice roll mat that's gonna keep you nice and comfortable. That stuff you need to do research in and experimenting and testing with before you actually get out into the wild. Um, the same with signal, to be honest. If you're looking at a map, you know, if you're comfortable reading a map with navigation, you should be able to look at that and be like, okay, if I'm higher up, I'm much more likely to have signal. You could even scout out the location, certainly if you're, you're, you're wanting to start nearer to home, first of all, beforehand, and you can check if there's signal. You know, if you really feel that's something very important for you so that you can contact somebody if you need to, perhaps just have a, a reassuring word with a friend or family member or a spouse or whatever, um, then that's totally fair. That's totally understandable. I'm, I'm of the same opinion. It can be very helpful. But at the same time, you know, if this is something you're trying to do yourself, you need to be able to trust yourself. You need to build that relationship with yourself. And the only way you can do that is to be with yourself. And that's something... That's, that's something we become more comfortable with the more we do. Just working on my second breakfast. Oh, vitamin C. How oh, I need this stuff. <laughs> oh, that's so good. So sort of the penultimate thing to consider then is, is where are you going to pitch and where are you going to get your water? So again, that's something you can prepare for in advance to a degree. You can take a look at the map. You can look for a flattish bit um, that's perhaps not in the way of a watercourse or in the, in the event of a watercourse rising, um, you know, that's got some kind of shelter, especially if you're going for stealth camping. Perhaps you can camp on the edge of a woods, certainly, you know, a way off a footpath. Um, that's something you're going to be able to see a lot clearer on the ground as well. Essentially, you're looking for somewhere flat, somewhere reasonably dry that's not going to flood, somewhere that's perhaps sheltered from the wind or sheltered from view as well um, and somewhere that um, is, is, is just going to be safe and comfortable for you. There's a few other things to consider. We'll talk about setting up a wild camping pitch in a different video. And then the final thing to consider is, is water. 
you know where are you going to get your water so perhaps if you're just going for a single overnighter you might carry water in and that's that you know just carry in a couple of extra liters to make a brew and do some cooking um, but you you're going to need to get water from somewhere if you're you're going for a few nights and essentially it's just keeping your eye out for water sources um, you know i would be loathed to get water from this valley because there's sheep everywhere on all the fields and uh, that's going to really need purifying. So water purification is a, is a conversation for a different video, but essentially you need to consider how you can purify your water. If you're up in the mountains and you've, you know, you've got melt water from the snow, you know, like I had on the Tour de Mont Blanc, it's going to be pretty clean. It's going to be safe. Boiling it is probably not going to hurt, but then having a filter like a soya micro squeeze or some kind of soya product um, or some kind of like, I don't know, life straw, whatever it might be, it's just going to help protect you from, from any possible infection or disease that might come through the water. But um, if you're really concerned about the water as you're going along your day, collect it where you can, you know, downloads of water, then get some more, purify it, and then you've got that in your pack. Um, water is, is usually a bit of a barrier and concern for me because I drink and use a lot of water. So um, yeah, just basically keeping an eye on the map, looking for water courses, and uh, also remembering that they don't always stay true. <laughs> so um, on the Two Moors Way, I wild camped on Dartmoor, and it was a scorching summer. Um, I had in advance picked a wild camping spot, but when I got there, the water source was dried up and it was just muddy and disgusting. So I had to ration my water. Um, but thankfully the next day I went past a pub and I walked in and asked for some water. So don't be afraid to ask for water if you're going through somewhere with civilization. Um, I'm sure people will be very happy to help you. <laughs> this is all I care about. Water. around here just gonna investigate in a graveyard you can never be too sure oh look at this it's a nana Hi. it's still alive <laughs> what's going on here <laughs> i'm dead walking <laughs> walking dead i'm a dead woman walking <laughs> what are you doing i'm refilling the water oh yeah yeah because we're thirsty we are we are a thirsty thirsty, bunch. thirsty hikers yeah once you are actually out and about wild camping, you've got your tent pitched up like this, make a brew and take the time to get grounded. Embrace your environment for all it is. You know, you're very likely to see the sunset and the sunrise, as I said before, long days out and about on the trail, you know, especially if you're trying to pitch when it's, when it's getting dark and you can be a bit stealthier there. Um, enjoy it, embrace it. There are going to be hard times. You are going to be pitching in the rain. You are going to be pitching in the dark. It probably is going to be muddy at points and boggy and sad and you might not have enough water and <laughs> it might be cold. That is what happens when you're out and about in nature. It's not an air conditioned car. It's not a heated living room or bedroom. This is the wild spaces that we are going out to enjoy and embrace. So let it be and learn to trust yourself and tap into yourself and the potential that lies within you throughout that experience. I know that sounds deep, but wild camping is something to be treasured. It's sacred, it's precious. So let's invest in the wild spaces that we go out into. Let's make sure we leave no trace and uh, let's keep this tradition going for a long, long time to go. And so to wrap this video up, the final two thoughts I've got um, kind of come in one thought, and that's by the time you get home, evaluate your experience. Did it go well or did it go badly? What went well and what went badly? And how can you improve that situation? Again, talk to people who are wild campers, talk to people who are neutral, talk to people who can remind you of who you are, empower yourself, and then hopefully your next experience will be even better. <laughs> Wow, now this is why people wild camp. Look at that sun coming up. It's just slowly burning off the mist during the time I was packing up.
so there we go guys that is my little video on overcoming wild camping fears when you're heading out alone um, or for the first time wild camping is a big deal please don't underestimate it i think there's certainly a bit of machoism about getting out while camping it's supposed to be easy it's supposed to be fluid but the truth is for a lot of us it's hard and it takes some evaluation and it takes some self-investment but i believe in you and i hope you too can now believe in you as well thank you for watching and until next time enjoy your adventures and stay wild i'll see you soon cheers <laughs>